Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you to worship here at St. Trinity in this, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. I am Pastor Paul Unlin. It's a pleasure to welcome you into the house of God, the family of God, as we gather together here this morning at St. Trinity. We extend a special welcome to those of you who are gathered here in person, those watching the live stream, or those who will be watching the recorded version at a later time. Again, we welcome you into the house of God, the family of God, gathered together here at St. Trinity. Um, if you happen to notice a little bit of Honolulu Blue, someplace that you have never, ever seen it before. <laughs> I have not lost my mind. I lost a friendly wager to uh, Pastor Matt over at Journey, so yeah, i am got to wear one of those jerseys today, so uh, if you see it. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, you got to be a man of your word, right? You got to be a man of your word, so that's what's going on if you see little glimpses and, and, and whatnot. If it wasn't a communion Sunday, I might have not even worn the robe, but, you know, it is a communion Sunday, so, uh, all right. <laughs> all right, let's see, if you'd like to stay up to, date, up to date with the goings on here at St. Trinity, you can do so through our website, stTrinityLutheran.com. You can follow us on the socials, or if you'd like to be a part of our email distribution list, just send an email to office at stTrinityLutheran.com. Uh, re request to be added onto the distribution list. And then you won't miss out on any of the goings on here at St. Trinity. A couple of quick announcements. So let's see. Uh, we are in October, whole new month. That means we've got a new stewardship message uh, that was, uh, writ is written by our board of stewardship uh, that uh, was sent to you in your email at the last Trinity Times. It's posted out in the uh, hallway. Always a, a good read, all, always very timely and pertinent to what's going on uh, in, right now and today. Uh, so I encourage you to read that. Uh, we've got some upcoming craft workshops for our holiday Christmas market. All right, the Christmas market takes place uh, at the same time while we're doing the uh, Christmas trains and while Santa's here and all the other fun stuff. Uh, so if you are a crafter or somewhat crafty, uh, enjoy crafts or whatever, uh, there is a couple of workshops coming up for that. Uh, it'll be on Wednesday the 16th at 11.30 or on Wednesday and, and on Wednesday the 23rd at 10.30. Are those going to be in the fellowship hall? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. That's what my assumption had been. Uh, but yeah, so those will be in the fellowship hall right around the corner here. Uh, for our, uh, It is time for our Ladies Guild annual nut sale. Uh, orders are due back on the 13th, those order forms. Uh, you got it in your email again, uh, but also in the far back corner at the information center is if you want a paper copy of the uh, order forms. And again, those are due back on the 13th. Uh, also coming up this next weekend, uh, and next week, the 13th and 16th, our uh, quilters uh, will be having their quilts out. Uh, we're blessing, are we blessing them too? Yes, we are. All right, we are. I, I, I assumed we were, uh, but I wanted to make sure. We're blessing the quilts, and some will be offered for sale, and then some will be packed up and shipped off uh, across the country and around the world. Uh, then also, the same week, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Our Altar Guild is having their annual Rada Cutlery Sale. It'll be taking place the same time. And then, whew, I'm going to go parched, uh, just getting through the announcements this morning. Uh, our quarterly voters' assembly coming up Sunday, October 20th uh, at 1045. There will be no adult Bible study after the service. Um, I believe, Fred, you, go, you have, yes, Fred will have his before the service at 830. Uh, so make sure uh, that you're here for all of that. And if you need further information, uh, it went out in the Trinity Times this last week, too. So you can check on it there. But as our Heavenly Father has called us, has gathered us, has brought us together here this morning to be one people, to be one family, he does come to us through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and he comes bringing us his good and bountiful blessings, as today we receive the gift of the forgiveness of our sins through confession and holy absolution, as today we receive the gift of our Lord's word, his word of life, his word that takes us who were once dead and brings us to life, life everlasting, lived in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And also, as this morning, our Heavenly Father invites us to come and to gather together at the feast table and to partake of the very body and blood of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that same body and blood offered upon the cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And so today, we rejoice and we are glad in this day that our Lord has made. Well, uh, the topic of marriage is not one that often comes up in the lectionary, I mean, really, other than uh, creation and uh, the wedding at Cana. It's just not a part of a regular liturgical uh, lectionary readings. Um, 
But God does have a purpose and a reason for marriage and how we are to live in it and what it, marriage is supposed to uh, symbolize to us today, right? Today, both our Old Testament and our gospel lesson talk about God's action in and through marriage and what we can learn about who we are as God's people and how he is calling us to live. Our topic of conversation this morning, what God has joined together. At this time, though, as you're able, you're invited to stand and turn and greet your neighbor in the name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we join together now singing our opening hymn, Jesus, Name Above All Names. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment now and pause to reflect upon our own sinful nature and upon our God's most holy word. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake, he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together now in singing our hymn of praise, This is the Feast.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated now for our readings. Our Old Testament reading for this morning is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle for this morning is from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him for a little while, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand if you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. And we join together now singing the Alleluia in verse. According to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees came up and, in order to test Jesus, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. 
But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Okay, at this time, the grown-ups, you may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward for a special message. Here we go. All right, all right, all right. Well, good morning, everybody. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. you guys are not not very wide awake this morning, are you? Still kind of sleepy? Yeah, guess what? You think I'm sleepy too? Yes, I am sleepy too. But that's okay. It's a good day. Um, It's a beautiful day because it's the day the Lord has made. And we get to come together here and we get to hear about Jesus. So, In a couple of our readings today, um, we hear uh, God talking about children. What do you think God has to say about kids? He loves them. He loves them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? We should be nice to them. Okay. Anything else? They're sensitive. Okay. Lucy, were you going to say something? What do you think God says about kids? Be kind. Yeah. Right, right. So, do you... Hmm? Love them. Yes, absolutely. So do you think kids are important in the kingdom of God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Children are very important in the kingdom of God. And in fact, in in Hebrews today, uh, God talks about uh, that children are a special gift of God, right? The children God has given to me. Uh, At the end of our gospel lesson, Jesus, right, all the parents are trying, they're wanting to bring their kids to see Jesus, and do you know what the disciples are doing? Pushing them away. Yeah, no, 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 no. We don't need to waste time on kids. All right. All right. Yeah, bye-bye, kids. All right. <laughs> right. That's not, and, and Jesus says, wait, 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 wait. Jesus says, wait. Bring the children to me. Bring the children to me. Children are important. And he goes on to say that, here, let's say, uh, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, horses and children aren't quite the same. But, uh, but right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, right, so what does it mean to receive like a child? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, do you have a job? No. no not yet, not yet. Okay. You, you're going to go to work next week? Oh, I have a job, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to work, right? Um, but you, you don't have a job, right? So you're not earning any money. C- can, can you buy the kingdom of God? No. Um, do you just... It's against the law, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, can, can, can you uh, earn the kingdom of God? No. Do you deserve the kingdom of God? No, right? All we can do is receive the kingdom of God like a gift, right? And... Right, we don't deserve any of it, right? We can't pay for it, we don't earn it, we don't deserve it, but God says, if you receive the kingdom of God like a child, you are a part of the kingdom of God. And, guess what? Do you think that gift of God is ever going to be taken away from you? Yeah. Nope, that's God's eternal promise. You are a part of his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Pretty cool, right? Forever and ever. All right, will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. thank you so much. For loving me and dying for my sins. Thank you for making me a part of your kingdom and help me to share your love with others. 
In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you can go back and have a seat with your folks. And we join together now singing our hymn of the day, Only by Grace. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours this day from God, our Father, from our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, as I said at the beginning of the service, um, marriage and everything that goes into marriage is not one of those things that come up very often in the le- course of the lectionary. And as a pastor, I generally don't get a whole lot of opportunity for following along with the lectionary to actually preach about marriage. In fact, generally, the only time I get to preach about marriage is actually at a wedding. And it can be a little problematic, and it can for a couple of reasons. So, um, right, so one, I, I am, it's kind of my last instructions, if you will, to the bride and the groom. However, the bride and the groom honestly aren't really paying much attention to anything other than hoping that they get through this, hoping nothing goes wrong, and maybe the bride is hoping she doesn't trip over her dress and all this other stuff, and they're not listening to me at all, right? I can tell. I can see the static between, uh, behind their eyes, and all they're hoping they can do is repeat after me when we get to that part, right? So I completely understand that the bride and the groom, they're not paying attention, but that's okay, right? I've had months of talking with them and meeting with them and talking and, and do, going through counseling and all that other stuff. I've had some time with them, right? So bride and the groom, they're present, generally not paying real close of attention to what I'm saying. The others, right, the guests, who have plenty of opportunity to, right? They're sitting, they're comfortable, nobody's staring at them or the back of their heads, right? They should be listening. And of course, I'm also preaching to them too, but the guests really aren't listening to me either. And you know why? They're thinking about the party that's to come, right? And how long is he going to drone on? And when are we going to get to the end of it and go, Boop, all right, now we're done, now we can go party, and that's how we're going to spend the rest of the night, right? That, I get it. I understand, right? So it's kind of exciting when I get the opportunity to actually preach about marriage and what goes into marriage and the whys and the wherefores and all the other fun stuff that goes with marriage, right? Just it doesn't come up often, and I love to have the opportunity, right? And today, as we hear, marriage is a part of the created order, and it is God has an intention for marriage. Right? God has an intention and a purpose for marriage, and unfortunately, like everything else after the fall, marriage itself has been corrupted by sin, along with everything else. Right? 
Now, to really understand, right, we have to go all the way back to the very beginning, which fortunately, uh, the lectionary does for us today, right? We go all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter 2, right? Uh, Adam and Eve, right? The Lord God said, it's not good that, a man, that the man should be alone. I'll make a, a helper fit for him, right? In the beginning, it was just Adam. It's not good to be alone. God sends all the livestock and all the animals to him. Not because God thinks that one of them is going to be just fine. But it was to demonstrate to Adam that he needed somebody special. He needed somebody particular, and not just anything would work. Right? The man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heaven and every beast of the field. But to, for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So then we know what happens. God puts, a sleep, puts Adam to sleep, and then he takes a rib. And from the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he brought, made into a woman, brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This is how God intended it to be. Two becoming one. Becoming really two sides of the same coin. To be perfectly supportive of one another, to be perfectly complimentary of one another, and not compliment like, hey, that's a nice outfit today, but actually right, having strengths and weaknesses that offset one another. To be able to work together um, and, and to be fully, perfectly united. God intended this to be a perfect and complementary relationship where man and woman would love one another, would support one another, would help one another, would actually be of one heart and mind. This is how God intended things to be. And this was also the very beginning, the creation, not just of man and woman, but it was the creation of the family unit, and the family unit is intended by God to be the foundation of society. All of society, even as we know it today, is built upon the family. Right? One family is a household. Several families become a village or town. More families become a city. More and more families become a, a, a county, become a state, become a country. But it's all predicated, predicated and founded on the family unit. Husband and wife father and mother, God has joined them together, and it's to be eternal. It's to be a forever relationship. Now, we also know, right, because the very next chapter tells us in Genesis, as great and wonderful as it all started out, then it kind of goes to pieces, right? We know how the story goes. This perfect perfection does not last, right? They're walking in the garden. The Eve is tempted by the snake. They eat the fruit. Or Eve eats the fruit. Adam watches what goes on. Adam eats the fruit. He doesn't drop dead either. God comes, calls them out on their sin. They have to admit what they've done. God covers, and let's put a pin in it right there, right? Because what happens when God catches them and calls them out on their sin, right? We've talked about this before. First thing Adam does is he tries to throw both Eve and God under the bus. Absolute brokenness enters into the, into the relationship in that moment. What was supposed to be a perfect relationship of, of loving one another, of supporting one another, uh, uh, of helping one another, of being one, in that moment is utterly broken. And in its place, in the place of love and support and help, is suspicion. It's blame. It's discord. Instead of a oneness, there is a brokenness that man and woman cannot fix on their own. And then, is it any wonder our world is in the state that it is today? Because when the foundation is broken, everything that is built upon that foundation is also broken. 
when the family unit is broken, the various societies built upon those family units are also broken. And the issues that tore apart that tore apart the first family, they're the same issues that tear apart our families today. Blame, suspicion, discord. It's never my fault. It's always the other one's fault. I, of course, would never do anything wrong. I, of course, would never do anything bad. I, of course, am a perfect saint in the relationship. Have you seen them? It's what it sounds like when guys get together and talk about their wives and wives get together and talk about their guys. They're, right? it's, it goes both directions, right? It's never the individual's fault. It's always my spouse's fault for everything else that's going wrong in my marriage and all everything else that's going wrong in my family. Right? Our families today are torn apart for the same reasons and for the same purposes. We don't trust one another. And it's all about, well, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I, and it's not about the we, the oneness of the we that God has joined together. Now, not all marriages are rife <laughs> with, with strife and discord, but even in the very best of marriages, there are always challenges and difficulties. Right, we talked about it a couple weeks ago with raising kids, right? It's sinners trying to raise sinners. Well, in a marriage, it's a sinner trying to live with another sinner. It's a sinner trying to have a relationship with another sinner. And we're all always about the me rather than the we. We're always about my stuff and not about how can we work together. But it shouldn't surprise us, right? We know Right? What is the, the very theological definition of sin? Right? We've talked about it before, the fancy Latin, homo, homo and cavatus and say, right? but really it's man curved and turned and focused on himself. The theological definition of sin is selfishness, is self-centeredness. So is it, any, is it surprising at all that in any marriage there's not strife and discord? In many ways, in many ways, it's surprising when a marriage actually lasts. Because what it means is that the husband and wife have lear- had to learn how to forgive. They had to learn how to forgive one another and to live with one another, warts and faults and all the other stuff tossed in there. And it's not easy. But this selfishness that infects in in all marriages, right, this is really is the hardness of heart that Jesus mentions today in our gospel lesson. Right? The, decide, the crowds were asking about, is it okay to divorce? And uh, Jesus says, well, what did Moses say? And they're like, hey, Moses said no problem. You write out the certificate, hand it to her, kick her to the curb. It's done. Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment. Because you were not willing to live with one another, to love one another, to forgive one another, because of your hardness of heart, your own selfishness, Moses said, okay, this is the way you have to go about it. Then he goes on, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is the hardness of heart. Because we don't want to forgive the other. We don't want to love the other as myself. And so it's easier to carry a grudge. It's easier to say thanks but no thanks. It's easier to say put a fork in it, we're done. It's over. The hardness of heart is really, it's a sin that breaks, well, what Jesus would have called the second commandment. 
right? It's an unwillingness to forgive. It's an unwillingness to love your spouse as yourself. Or to put it in terms we're more familiar with, it's an unwillingness to love our neighbor, our closest neighbor, by the way, as ourself. And when we're not willing to love them as ourselves, we're certainly not willing to forgive them. And so each and every little thing they do that gets on your nerve starts grating and grating and grating. And then you carry a deeper and deeper grudge. And then there's the fussing, the fighting, the arguing. Things flying through the air. And yet, and yet, wow, it suddenly got loud there. And yet, throughout Scripture, time and again, God speaks of marriage as being an image of his relationship with his people. And you, we stop and think, and okay, we look at our marriages, right? And uh, I don't know that I'd want my, you know. And, and I'd say I, I've got a pretty good marriage, right? We, Jennifer and I are happy together. Been together 32 years. But I don't know that I'd want my marriage to be the image of God to his people, as good as my marriage is. I don't know that any of you would want the same. Would you want how you and your spouse live and love and act towards one another to be how the Almighty God decides to treat his people? Thank you. I, I heard that and that was perfect. From the mouths of children, right? Right? In the Old Testament, we see Israel being described as unfaithful and adulterous, and through it all, God being patient and forgiving. Well, it's great that God is patient and forgiving, but we certainly don't want to be the uh, unfaithful and adulterous Israel. But even in the face of Israel's adultery and chasing after other gods, God is patient and he is forgiving, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love for generations. We've got the New Testament. Jesus and his relationship with the church is also uh, put together as an image of, uh, of what marriage is to be like. And we see Jesus rescuing and redeeming. We see Jesus, oh, wait a minute. It's the self-sacrifice of Jesus. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know that we like to talk about that part because that means now we have to set aside the, the me in the relationship. But the, these images of marriage we see in Scripture are to be a, 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 a way of understanding God and His people. God and His love for His people. God ultimately sacrificing Himself so that his people could be restored to him, that his people could live. And then God providing an eternity for his people. This image of God's faithfulness and God's forgiving nature towards his people does need to be the image that we each take into our own marriages. When we consider our spouse, they're not just the person sitting across from us at the breakfast table or the dining room, dinner table. They're not just the person we happen to wake up next to in the morning and go to bed next to in the evening. This spouse is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We are two sides of the same coin. When one is hurt, the other should cry. We are to be constantly loving and supporting and, yes, sacrificing ourselves for one another. Because a, a healthy marriage, a long-lasting marriage requires work, and it requires hard work. It requires sacrificial work. It requires putting the benefit of the other over and above my own. And that is hard to do, right? Because we are by nature selfish individuals and learning to love our spouse as our own flesh does not come naturally. 
But Paul tells us, right, love is not envious, it's not boastful, it's not rude, it's not arrogant. Love is patient, love is kind, love is gentle, love is forgiving. And so in our marriages, as we model this, not only for our children, but for those in our lives, it gives us the opportunity to truly live as God's own people, to be Christ to our neighbor, as Luther would describe it. We begin by being Christ to our closest neighbor, our spouse and our children. But then we live and we model this Uh, not being envious, not being boastful, not being rude or arrogant, being patient, being kind, being gentle and forgiving to all of our neighbors. And yes, again, we begin with those closest to us and it moves out from there. But now we get to live and love as God's own people. And so now having been truly loved by God, in a manner that is unimaginable. Let us learn to love like God loves us. Let us learn to forgive one another like God loves us. And let, us, let it begin here in our own households, in our own families, and in this household of faith that God has given to us at St. Trinity. Amen. And now may the peace, that peace which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he returns again. Amen. At this time now, as you're able, you're invited to please stand as we join together in confessing our common Christian faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now having worshipped our Lord in word and in song, we now worship our Lord with our offerings. As the offering is gathered, we ask you to please fill out the uh, fellowship pad, generally found in the center aisle, and pass that down so we have a record of your visit with us here this morning. You may be seated now as we worship our Lord with our gifts.
now at this time as the offering is brought forward. And as you're able, you're invited to please stand as we join together in singing the doxology. continue now with the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Loving Father, your son took the little children into his arms and he blessed them. Help your saints to welcome little ones with joy that nothing may hinder their entrance into the kingdom of God and into the arms of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, be near all couples who may be struggling in their marriages. Guard them, we pray, from hardness of heart that would separate what you have joined together and that you would reconcile them to, live, reconcile them to one another, that they may live in Christ's forgiveness and in his love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, grant your wisdom to all public servants and to those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and in every place, that they may be strengthened and upheld in every good deed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you promise to abide with your people and uphold them in their suffering. Comfort, we pray, all those who are sick and sorrowing. We especially remember before you this day all of those impacted by the devastating storms of Helene and those in the path of the coming hurricane. We also remember before you uh, Mrs. Thompson, Sue Martinez, Pam Bodway, Scott Shire, Morell Stasel, Tom Grades, Judy Orler, Sawyer Pierce, Sharon Mott, and Norma Bauer. And in deepest Christian sympathy, Lord, we lift up to you the family and friends of Stephen Barron, Virginia Schultz, and Bill Allison, and all others in need of prayer who we now name before you in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen their faith in the midst of their trials, and that you would grant them health and healing according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, your Son gives us his very body and blood to eat and to drink in the supper. Grant us your grace, that we may approach your table with repentant hearts and a firm resolution to amend our sinful lives by the help of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord God, help us by your Spirit to fear you and to walk in your ways in Christ, that we may eat the fruit of the labor of our hands and receive your blessing in all that we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now at this time, as you're able, you're invited to please stand. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
And to you, the saints of God, as you go forth this day, living, loving, and forgiving as his own people, may our Lord bless you and keep you. May our Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. We join together now singing our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.